Oh, welcome. I want to thank uh, Bob and Rich for uh, giving us a report on the international meeting that took place in Avalon. Uh, there were 80 people at this meeting from around the world, and I think that it really, really shows us the place of the lay Christians in the order and in the church. I truly believe that the lay Christians they really came out of nowhere. We have never had them in our history. Uh, they've never, um, uh, yes, it, it's just a totally new organization in the order and in the church. And it's, I believe, it's one of the new movements that have risen uh, since the Vatican Council, what they call the new movements. There are about 10, I think there's 20, and uh, every Pentecost, uh, the, the, the Holy Father uh, asks them all to come to Rome uh, to celebrate the existence of these new movements in the church. There's the Focolari, there's the Christianity, uh, there's the Catechumenate. Uh, you can Google them and to find out what they're all about. But as far as I can see, you are the only people that are dedicated to uh, a contemplative charism. So I think you have a very, very, without knowing it, without anything being really announced by any great people in the church, it's happened. It's been going on for 20 years, I guess. And uh, you're, you're all part of that. And it's alive. And um, the fact that the Abbot General of our order uh, went to the meeting uh, to prepare for uh, the, 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 um, the general chapter, which will take place in the fall, each year at the general chapter, uh, each time we have a general chapter, which is every three years, uh, there is a representatives from uh, the lay Cistercians explaining what, what it's all about to these abbots who really don't know what it's all about. Uh, but, but some of them, of course, have it in their, their own communities, uh, but it's bigger than, than the people who, who really understand it. Uh, so it's, it's, I, I just want to uh, affirm that the importance of this movement in the church. It is a real, real new gift to the church. It's a new movement. Then I have another thing to tell you, that we just had our uh, annual retreat, and it was given to us by the abbot of Mount St. Bernard's Abbey in England. Now, Mount St. Bernard's Abbey is the only um, Cistercian community in England that has been revived since the Reformation. There were many, many famous monasteries uh, in England uh, before the Reformation, but they were all uh, closed and destroyed, and the ruins of many of these places still exist in the countryside around England of the great abbeys that were once there. And um, uh, so, but there's one that has been restored, and that is Mount St. Bernard's. Well, it was this abbot that came here, the abbot of that monastery, that came here to give us our annual retreat. And I had a chance to talk to him and tell him about, um, uh, about you, and that we were working on um, Olivia Clement's book, uh, The Roots of Christian Mysticism. And he says, well, I know uh, Clement very well. He said he was a friend of my monastery, and he used to come to Mount St. Bernard's, and it was one of my monks that translated from the French to the English his book, The Roots of Christian Mysticism. Not only that, but when this young abbot was going off, he, he, he's a brilliant, brilliant man. He, he's one of the stars of the general chapter. Uh, well, he uh, graduated from Cambridge uh, University in, in, in England, has a doctorate from Cambridge. From there, he, he joined the Trappist and was sent to Rome to study. And he's got another doctorate uh, in, in, in Oriental Studies in Rome. Part of his studies was to go to Paris 
and study with Olivia at Clermont, mm. which is very, very interesting. So, Olivia Clermont has sort of become alive for us. He isn't just the author of this book. He has a connection with um, our community uh, in, in England. And uh, well, anyway, um, so that this abbot would go to class to, to, um, to Olivia's commence class in his home. He became ill and he couldn't travel. So he would have his students come to his home outside of Paris and they'd come to his dining room and get their, their, their classes in, uh, I believe, of the Syriac um, studies. Because this, this, this uh, abbot, his studies are uh, in, in, in Oriental uh, religion. But anyway, that, that brings uh, Clement a little bit alive. He isn't just the, 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 the cold author of this uh, marvelous book. Well, let's spend a few seconds uh, digesting all that. <laughs> I no longer call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is about. Instead, I call you friends, since I have made known to you all that I heard from my father. It is not you who chose me, it is I who chose you. Go forth and bear fruit. Your fruit must endure, so that all you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. The command I give you is this, that you love one another. Well, this month we are looking at prayer, the chapter on prayer. Now, when you think about it, prayer is the greatest reality in this creation outside of our own uh, souls. God created souls, and then he created this reality of prayer. I have said before that all prayer is a response to a grace that has been given to us first. It is prayer that God has for us. It is his way of communicating with us. I have chosen you. He is the one who created us. He is the one who keeps us in being. He is the one that takes care of us. But prayer is, you might say, a kiss. It is a love relationship. It is the way that he wants to embrace us. I call you friends, but not cold friends, dear friends. Dear friends whom I love, whom I have chosen, and whom I want to communicate with you. Prayer is God's communication with us first. The prayer is coming from him. Now, this chapter in the book, I can truly, well, you might say I'm exaggerating, but, you know, it's about 30 pages long, but I don't think you would can find any 30 pages more beautiful than these 30 pages in this book. It is absolutely exquisite uh, the way Clement describes the reality of prayer. Now, I would like to organize this talk, I guess you say, um, by having a little bit of structure to it. I would like to go um, and, 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 and look at the whole chapter. Now, as you know, I have said before many times, that we begin with the very end. We begin our life 
that baptized Christians at the end of life. We have the essence, the substance of eternal life the moment we receive the gift of faith. Faith is the substance, the essence, the reality of union with God in paradise. We've got it. We've got it now. Then we become little children and we run around and by the time we're seven or eight we receive First Holy Communion. And the, the church and the, 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 the genius of people Whoever thought it up to dress little girls in wedding dresses and little boys in little suits or whatever, their first communion is a momentous occasion in their life. After baptism, it is the next great moment in their life. Because at communion, you have the ultimate reality of union with God in this nuptial movement this nuptial relationship that is between your soul and God in communion, do you realize what happens when you go to communion? Jesus devours you. It is a nuptial relationship. He loves you as the most cherished, coming to you freely and giving himself to you as as, as himself. Everybody who's in love says, oh, I would love to eat that baby. I love my baby so much I just want to eat him. Only Jesus has accomplished that. The only love relationship that is in existence where the beloved and the loved eat one another and devour one another it is in this relationship of communion. We have that at the beginning. We we're just little kids. The rest of our life, we can spend trying to appreciate what that means. Now, the fullest appreciation of what that means, I believe, is in the, 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 the church's uh, tradition of the meaning of prayer. Prayer is a substantial, essential union of your soul with God. And the greater the prayer becomes through, through, through years and years and years, as somebody said this morning, I've been praying all my life, but I didn't know what it was. But I've been doing it all my life. Sure you have. But if you only could see, if there was only a barometer or something could show you what is, how that is developing through your life. Well, the mystics, the people who have been so blessed by God uh, as to experience that reality, they have given us a body of literature. And that's what Clement here in this chapter, he is giving us from the very beginning of the Christian church, beginning especially with Origen. Origen <coughs> was born in the year 185. That's pretty far back. But there is this this notion, this idea of the relationship between this nuptial relationship between the soul and, 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 and Jesus comes through the years and then comes the Cistercian uh, order and the early Cistercian fathers. And if you remember three, three years ago, I guess it is, uh, the first thing that I wanted you to read was William of St. Thierry. Because I, in my experience, William is the most scrumptious, the most beautiful uh, expression of uh, the relationship between the soul and Jesus. And now I don't know if I can read it. Uh, sometimes I can't. It, it's too emotional. But uh, let me see if I can get through it just a little bit. For you, O bridegroom of chaste souls, say to the bride, I go away and I come. Nor do you remain with her forever. 
in like manner, O Father of orphans, by the prudent counsel of your wisdom, while your children are exiled in a land not their own, you suffer them sometimes to be disheartened in the grief of their desire, as if they were cut off from you, and to pine away with love for your love. You purify them in the furnace of their poverty, drawing them to yourself the more strongly by the very difficulty of attaining you. But sometimes, by the sweetness of your grace, you open to your little ones of your own accord. Nor do you send them away when they reach you. You suffer them to be drawn and weep in your bosom. They weep and refuse to be comforted, lest they be prevented from weeping in your presence. While they esteem as your highest gift the privilege of weeping in your bosom. For they find it exceedingly good and sweet to weep before you. O Lord their God, who did create them, and you form them for this very reason, that they may weep in your bosom. And when, and when you deign to wipe away their tears, they flood them all the more, because the very hand that wipes them sweeps causes sweet grief which attracts and soothes them. The very harder they weep, the more greatly it consoles them by the by the I can't read it by the conviction of good hope. For that stream of tears gives them such joy that it clearly manifests your presence. Yet, at the same time, your children, sojourning in this strange land, cannot forget that they are pilgrims. That joy and that grief, while they exist together, call both sweet and delightful tears. Tears because of grief, sweet because of love, love of you, O oh love. To suffer before you is great joy. To weep before you supreme consolation. And to rejoice in you is supreme beatitude. Now, that's 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 where we're going. That is the, 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 the yeah. The experience of this union that God wishes to bring us to, which is a the, the experience of the attitude, the experience of being in heaven, uh, in union with God in paradise. That's it. And William had that genius to be able to do that. Well, now uh, I can say that Clement, uh, in this in this chapter. He does the same thing. In this chapter, he shows us the beauty, the beauty of the experience of this union with God. That somebody in this world was able to put into writing this experience. 
Now certainly Teresa of Avila did, John of the Cross did, many of the great saints did. Now because we know that St. John of the Cross in modern times and in Teresa of Avila, they have been really established since the Reformation as the great doctors of mystical theology. Um, they, 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 they are the, the experts, you might say. She is a doctor of the church, and he is a doctor of the church. They, the, the church recognizes that these two authors uh, have something to say to us, and something to say to the modern world, that we are called to be in union with God, and it can happen in this world. And of course, it does happen in this world. Now, Clement, as I say, I want to take you to the end. So the first thing I want to do is take you to the end of this chapter in what, what, what Clement is saying. Now, at the end of the chapter, Clement is quoting Origen, where Origen says that now that you have reached this, uh, uh, this, this great union with God uh, in prayer, now you can go out and bring it to your, your, your workplace. You've got to do your duties, you've got to do what you have to do, uh, you've got to lead a life. And Origen had enough sense to, to say that, yes, now you, 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 you do something about it. You bring it into the world, this experience of God. And that's what I think is so beautiful for you. You folks are going to go uh, leave here this afternoon. And you're going to go back to your families, you're going to go back to your home, back to your workplaces. But you bring something there. And that is this reality. This mystical reality of God in union with the soul, whom he has chosen. He chose you, that he's going to use you to be a fire. And, and, and Origen uses that expression, a fire in the world, uh, and this has nothing to do with ego and all that sort of stuff, that's a waste of time. Uh, this is the reality of God's purpose, for you to be where you are, and to from there uh, radiate this, this, this commandment of Jesus to love one another, to show love in this world. We all know that there's an awful lot of love out there. Uh, I've told you before that I, I get out of infirmary, we have these wonderful, wonderful women and men working for us and um, as, 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 as nurses. And if one thing I have learned listening to them is how much love there is. Uh, everybody can, can complain about everything, you know, the, the world is, uh, you know, everything is bad. But there's love. There's love between parents and their children. There's love between grandparents and their grandchildren. And let me tell you, it is beautiful. Now, Clement uses this imagery of family, of family love, to show the reality of continual prayer. He says, when a mother is asleep in a bedroom and the baby is in the next room, She's aware of every sound of that baby. She is aware of the presence of that baby. Now, that is what Clement uses, and that is what is the reality of continual prayer. Continual prayer is nothing but the awareness of the divine presence, awareness of the good, awareness of love. Now, when someone loves someone, that reality of that other person is there in their mind, in their soul. And with the parents, of course, it's there for the rest of their life. Uh, we have a lady that, that her, her, her daughter is sick uh, with, with cancer and stuff. Um, that daughter is in her mind all the time. No matter, even though the daughter is married, she has got her own children. And she's aware of the daughter, she's aware of these grandchildren, 
uh, that is love. And that's what uh, this continual prayer is. Continual prayer starts, as Clemens, uh, the, the first uh, uh, paragraph, it's about conversation with God. Prayer begins as a conversation with God. But it can develop through the years into an awareness that is continual. Now that doesn't mean that you're always thinking about God. In fact, Clement says that you've got to get rid of all thought and idea and concept because it's beyond that. Just as the, the, the mother's love and, and, and is, is beyond idea and thought and concept. It just is. The mother is aware of her children. And uh, uh, the, 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 she doesn't have to sit there and think about it. Uh, it's just there. It is a reality. It's an awareness of divine presence. Now, the Cistercian uh, statutes of the uh, uh, of the order, in the very definition of the purpose of the order, is to bring us to the continual mindfulness of the presence of God. Now the monastery is all set up to do that. But it's bigger than that. It's bigger than the mindfulness of an image of God. As soon as we use the word God, we create an image. Now, of course, the Jews won't even use the word God. They just go G dot D, uh, because it's a concept, it's an idea. It's, 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 it's limiting, whereas the reality of God is boundless, but it's boundless um, in connection with love and goodness. God is the source of all good. There is nothing good in this world that doesn't come from God. There is no love in this world that doesn't come from God. Now, if you remember, uh, when we were studying the, um, the encyclical of Pope uh, Francis, and he talked about the leaf. Look at the leaf, and the wonder that you experience between you and the leaf, that is... Um, uh, the, 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 the gift from God the, is contemplative prayer. That's con contemplation. Something's going on between you and that leaf, and we call it wonder. You look at it. Wonder. Okay, don't take the leaf up, but put a human soul there. Look at a human soul. And if God so wishes, he can reveal to you the beauty of that human soul. Now, once you have been shown the beauty of that human soul, you are sunk. No matter where you come across this soul, this person, but somebody in your life, in your workplace or wherever, of course it, it you don't have to. You don't even have to pick up your children. You know the beauty of them anyway. But say that there's somebody that out of the blue comes into your life, and um, uh, you hold that person up figuratively, you know, and look at her, and somehow God shows you the beauty that is there. That's the beginning of love, and that is the beginning of um, people getting engaged, people getting married. Um, marriage, this, this natural relationship is a gift from God. What you love of that other person is the goodness in that person. You know, I mean, you don't have to say that. You don't love the person because he's bad. But somehow God showed you the beauty of that soul. And you fall in love with it. And you get married, and then you, you know, and then you have your own children and all that. But that's all. That's the that's the realm in which we are living and, and, and talking. It's in the realm of gift from God to bring you to continual love, 
continual prayer, continual um, appreciation and, and, and mindfulness of what is. The is is God. God is love. God is goodness. And he can bring us to that uh, continuously, being aware of that goodness and love. And of course, this is the opposite of the poor people who are most of them are, are ill or something, who don't see the goodness in anybody. They just want war and, and um, you know, uh, we're reading the, 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 a book about uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, that poor man, he loved war. Literally, he loved war. He wanted to go off killing people. Uh, how, 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 how sad. What an opposite of um, uh, what, 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 what this is all about. You know, it's, 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 it's the reality of, of God and God bringing us into the reality that he is and bringing it to a point where it is continuous. Uh, there's nothing to separate you uh, from the reality uh, of the divine presence, the divine presence in this world. Remember when we, when we talked about um, uh, Origen saying that the side of Jesus was pierced and outflowed the, 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 the blood and covered the entire universe? Well, that's the divine milieu in which we live. We're living in this divine presence. Can we be aware of it? Yes, he can bring, he can bring us to it, and he brings it to us by showing us love, by bringing us into a uh, love relationship in marriage, and then in children, and then in grandchildren. Uh, yeah, this, this, this poor lady, her daughter is sick, and what she worried about, she's worried about the grandchildren. The grandchildren, she wants to have them be distracted from the pain uh, uh, of the mother being sick. So grandma is doing all she can to, 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 to make e life easy for these children. That's, uh, that's goodness. And that is in our world. Now that never gets in the newspaper. Uh, that